Nellie Donlan. Okay, we're going to start now. Must be related. Yeah, I'm live streaming. Oh, you're live? Yeah. Oh, right. Very good. Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2018. It's uh, great to have you here. You're all very, very welcome. And uh, we have um, two days of DNA lectures for you related to genetic genealogy. Um, and it's great to be in the iconic Titanic Center in Belfast for the first time. Hopefully this will become an annual event. Uh, we've been running it in Dublin now for the last six years, very, very successfully, and year on year the audiences just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's great to, to bring Genetic Genealogy Ireland to Belfast, and I'd like to thank the organizers, SLP, uh, for organizing Back to Our Past, and also our sponsors uh, of these DNA lectures, Family Tree DNA, who have a stand outside, and they are selling DNA kits there at incredibly reduced prices. So if you ever thought of having a DNA test, now is the time to do it. Um, I'd also like to thank my uh, fellow colleagues from ISOG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. We're all volunteers. Uh, we only do this because we love DNA and would do anything for it. And uh, we uh, have um, uh, a great array of speakers today who are all members of ISOG uh, and are going to give you uh, their experience running DNA projects and how to use DNA to help you in your family tree research. Um, and of course we also have to thank the North of Ireland Family History Society who have also helped organize this event and will be manning the Family Tree DNA stand uh, volunteering to help you uh, address any questions you might have regarding your own genealogy and how DNA might actually help that. So we're also joined uh, live uh, online uh, by about 400 people on Facebook. So a very big welcome to our Facebook viewers uh, this morning and for the next two days. 
Um, and uh, I'd like to first of all introduce our first speaker, who is Catherine Borges. Now, Catherine is the director of the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. She's a member of the Southern California Genealogical Society, Daughters of the American Revolution, and the Colonial Dames of the 17th century. Uh, she's also, and that's during her during the night time. Now, during the day, she <laughs> is the president of the Salida Chamber of Commerce. And Catherine will be giving us an introductory talk about DNA, so if you know nothing about it, Catherine is the best person to inform you and uh, encourage you and enthuse you. So please can we have a warm welcome for Catherine Borges. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Because I also tend to talk loud, so if I'm not talking loud enough, please raise your hand and point out. Or if I talk too loud, also please uh, let me know that too. Uh, also, please forgive me for my American accent. I do mispronounce words, um, but I have been trying to practice pronouncing the words correctly, like County Tyrone, instead of Tyrone, as most Americans would say, things like that. But I may slip up. I also sometimes slip up and, and refer to things that cost in dollars instead of pounds. So again, please forgive me if I make any of those gaps, I will try not to. So just to let you know as far as, I'd like to see a hands, how many here are new to using genetic genealogy or DNA for genealogy or are beginners? Oh, pretty good, good. Yeah, notice my friends in the front row did not raise their hands. <laughs> So anyhow, thank you very much for coming. I hope that you're also able to come to many of the other lectures because my talk is just a basic talk, but a lot of the other presenters give more detailed um, analysis of things like using autosomal DNA and how it's worked for them <coughs> and other tools, but mine's a very basic talk. I don't go into like a chemistry lesson or a biology lesson of DNA. The most complicated I get are on the words because there's really no escaping it. Y chromosome, you can say Y DNA, but it's the same thing. You can't really dumb it down. That's about as technical as I get. So um, just wanted to let you know those things. These are the three most important things you need to know when you're just starting out using genetic genealogy is the type of DNA tests that are available on the market, the ancestral paths that the DNA travels, like which applies to the test that you need to use and how it can work for you. So these are the four main types of DNA tests that are on the market. Uh, they debuted in about the year 2000. I got into using DNA in the year 2003. It was actually because I attended a Daughters of the American Revolution uh, lecture. And to be honest with you, the speaker's content went over my head and under my feet. I did not know what she was talking about. But I did get the message that she had tried it and it had worked for her. So that was incentive enough for me to go out and learn about it myself. Back in those days in 2003, the early days of DNA, there were only three companies that offered a DNA tests for ancestry purposes. The first one, well, both Family Tree DNA and Oxford Ancestors launched in the year 2000. Now, Oxford Ancestors is based in England, but you, they don't really market their tests for genealogy purposes, it's for deep ancestry purposes. Also, on the exchange rate for the amount of markers you get, it was exorbitant back in 2003. I think it was around 400 pounds. So um, then there was another company called Sorensen Molecular Foundation Project, and SMGF for short. And back in 2003, you could do the DNA test for free, which free is good, but at that time you did not get the results back. Later on they gave the results um, where you could get the results back and now you can't get the results because uh, Ancestry bought the database and is going to put the results into their database. So they, there's no way to access the results anymore. So that left Family Tree DNA. So I made a proposal to my cousins to try this Y chromosome DNA testing and one of my cousins uh, took me up on the offer and we, we started the testing my father because the Y chromosome, and I have some charts that show the path of how the DNA travels. That is the male gender chromosome, so only males have it. It's good for surname testing, although when you have, in countries like Ireland and Scotland, and when you have seps and clans, then it's, it gets a little more tricky, but I will show you that too, because my mother's maiden name is McCallum, so you know, it's obviously a clan surname. Um, 
The next type of DNA that was also available in the year 2000 was mitochondrial DNA. And it, it's, it is really good for deep ancestral purposes. It's a little more difficult to use for genealogical purposes, but it can be done and people do use it. So I don't discount mitochondrial DNA at all. And I have an interesting story on my mitochondrial DNA. Um, SNP stands for uh, single nucleotide polymorphism. We usually say SNP, or some people say SNP, it doesn't matter whichever you prefer. Uh, back in those early days, I heard more people use the term SNP, so I say SNP for SNP, because you really don't want to walk around saying single nucleotide polymorphism. That's a giant <laughs> mouthful, right? So what a SNP does is that confirms your deep ancestral origins on a direct Y chromosome line or a direct mitochondrial line. Now, Family Tree DNA will, they're the only company right now that does Y chromosome testing. Well, I should say only major company. There's smaller ones like I've heard of around, but for genealogical purposes, you'd want to use them. They're the only one that do Y chromosome testing right now, not counting the, you know, 23 meal will give you origins, but we're, we're talking about YSTRs. I'll get to that in a little bit. So on the Y chromosome, they'll give you a prediction of what your SNP is, your deep ancestral origins on that all male line. But if there's, if there's a little bit of a discrepancy, like uh, one of my, my grandmother's maiden name is Thompson, and I've seen Thompson's come in with a very unusual haplogroup, they will SNP confirm it for free. They have a quality assurance program. And then they do SNP confirm mitochondrial DNA testing for free. It's included, and they're the only company that does that. 23andMe um, has SNPs that they will give you the haplogroup, but they only give you a prediction, um, and I've seen it be wrong. So one of my relatives had it wrong, and I, I messaged them, and they fixed it. So those are two of the benefits with uh, on the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial, with the, with the SNP testing. And then autosomal DNA. Back in 2000, when autosomal DNA testing first debuted, um, it was very primitive. It had a very limited number of SNPs that it used for the autosomal DNA, but now, in uh, 2007, 23andMe was the first company to come out with an autosomal DNA test. They marketed it primarily for um, medical purposes because the founder uh, of 23andMe, one of the founders, she was married to the founder of Google and he had Parkinson's in his family. So they started this DNA company and wanted to see if they could find a way to uh, identify DNA connected to diseases. When the test first debuted, it was $999. I'm sorry, I don't know the pound conversion for that, but that was pretty expensive when it came out in 2007. In 2009, they debuted it for ancestry purposes. Uh, and geological purposes, and they lowered the price. Well, it first was $999, then it was $750, and then it was uh, $150 by 2009. So you can see how the price really dropped. So the introductory price was $150, and so I tried it out. And to be honest with you, I was not really interested in the medical part of the test because I figured I already know my genealogy, I already know what my ancestors and family, what diseases we have, but I actually did learn things that were very helpful from it, so I don't discount it anymore. Uh, 23andMe has since changed their website a little bit, and they still offer the medical, but they um, it's more limited than what they had initially, so I just want to let you know that. But for genealogy purposes, it, it worked great. So um, Family Tree DNA, not to be outdone, introduced their uh, autosomal tests three months later. So in about the early 2010 is when they launched and then they were followed by other companies like uh, several years later, Ancestry.com, several years later, DNA Heritage. DNA Heritage, uh, or My Heritage, they actually have a stand here too. They, um, so they contract with Family Tree DNA for the processing. So that's who's actually processing your test when you test through them. So anyways, the autosomal tests now are amazing for, um, you know, genealogical connections, and the price has really dropped. You know, now it's it's it ranges. So what is it here? Forty, think forty three. Forty three pounds, and so it's really dropped in price. But something I got to point out to you, especially for those of you that are new to it, you remember earlier when I said you know when they first came out they were nine hundred and ninety nine. 
So a lot of people think white chromosome and mitochondrial testing is expensive, but if you put it in comparison to those early days of autosomal testing, it wasn't. You know, but people that have been doing it for a long time, we don't view it as expensive because we knew what it used to cost. It's just that the market demand has driven, and competition, which is a good thing, has driven the price down. It's good for consumers. So, um, but the autosomal DNA, I'll go into that more on that in, in a minute. So where do you get DNA from? There's really only two sources of where you get DNA to do DNA testing, and that's from ancient remains and living descendants. So the reason I have Marie Antoinette up there is because um, they found a lock of her hair in a locket that had not been touched, you know, probably since she was alive. And that's very significant because a lot of times when your ancestors, if they left hair, some people have mourning wreaths or a hairpin. I ha actually have a hairpin of my great grandmother from Scotland. Um, we touch it and we contaminate it and the DNA degrades and breaks down. But because it was sealed in this locket, it didn't. So they DNA tested it and then they found a heart, um, a petrified heart in a goblet that was labeled under a cathedral in France and it had her son's name on it. So they DNA tested the petrified heart, they DNA tested the hair, it matched. And in 2004, they had a state funeral for her son. <coughs> So normally though, we don't get it from ancient remains. Although I will say that you will see more of this in the, in the respect of, and there are speakers that will talk about it here for the ancient remains that are around in Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, England, etc. You will see more of that come about. But um, I think that in a few years we will see, because there are companies doing testing on this, trying to find alternative sources. So for instance, hopefully eventually we'll be able to test stamps because a lot of us have old letters. I had an old letter from my grandfather had licked the seal on the envelope and the stamp and I put it into a plastic bag and put it in a lockbox to save, um, but the, it's 50 years old. So I, I'm kind of waiting for the technology to catch up to where it could be tested. However, I did luck out and did find a cousin in Scotland to test because that's actually much easier to do, the living descendants part. So I found a second cousin in Scotland to test as a proxy because my McCallum line has daughtered out in North America. There are no males left in North America. They're all, it's, we call that daughtering out. They only have daughters. So I did, I had to go to Scotland to find one and there could still be one in Ireland because you'll hear my story in a minute. So when it's done with living descendants, it usually is either a swab like we have here at the Family Tree DNA stall, or it is done with, um, you expectorate into a vial. So that's how the, the testing is normally done. So the path of Y DNA follows the paternal line, but there are you know, caveats to it with different ancestries. So for instance, you know, my, my surname is Borges, which is Portuguese. The Portuguese did not adopt a patriarchal surname pattern until 1900. So two generations before that, it's Machado. Two generations before that, it's Valine. You can't do surname testing when you have a um, you don't you have a broken surname line like that. But for a lot of the surnames in the Isles, you can do it, and also you can do it with clans. But then with the clans and the sects, you do have the caveat of. Um, sometimes they would take the name as a protectorate, so they're not all going to match. But it's still fascinating, the way you see my McCallum. Okay, so um, on, back to the SNP testing. So on the white chromosome, this, this is a family tree DNA chart. They're, they have a phylogenetic tree. This is a very condensed one. It's much more expanded now, has many more SNPs included. And they call, you know, the first man that they you could trace back to, they call him Adam, it's in quotes, because you know, it's not really Adam, but they just call him Adam. So um, th it, this is the tree of man on the, the Y chromosome. So these, these letters right here are what we call haplogroups. And most uh, Western European men are of R, haplogroup R. That's the most common one in Western Europe. And then, um, so all of these haplogroups, we know that they have origins. Now, something you need to know, especially when you're just starting out, is the male Y chromosome haplogroups and the female like uh, mitochondrial haplogroups do not correspond to each other. 
So a female H haplogroup is not going to be the same as a male H. They won't have the same origins. So scientists didn't set it up like that. It's a long story. That's a whole nother lecture sometime. So uh, I had just showed you the, uh, the Y chromosome tree from Family Tree DNA. Um, as Morris said in the introduction, I'm the director of ISOG, and we have a Y haplogroup tree that we maintain too. Now on our tree, it is, uh, we have a very strict criteria. I'm not the one that set it up because, you know, the people that first started this, they set up their own criteria for the tree and they still abide to that criteria, but it's on a more ancient level. But one thing that's nice about it is that we do include data from other companies and from um, different studies, but it's not the most comprehensive tree out there because too, we have very strict criteria. <coughs> So there's actually a tree that's done by Al Al Alex Williamson. That's probably one of the most com comprehensive trees out there if you want to see a tree. But a lot of people do use the ISOG y, y chromosome tree. It is cited in over 45 papers, scientific studies. Geneticists use it all the time. So because our standards are so stringent, that's why they cite it. So, and this is, this is on the ISOG site. There's a link to it. It's our most visited page. It's easy to find and you can learn more about your haplogroups when you DNA test. So I included this, this chart's a little dated, it's from several years ago, but I don't know of any, I don't know if there's any recent ones, but this, at least it gives you a picture. So these are, for the Y chromosome, these are different haplogroup origins and the percentage of where they fall in Ireland. And as you can see, R1B comes in at the highest amount. And then uh, I, haplogroup I is very common. Um, I is usually uh, tied to being Scandinavian, so a lot of people in the aisles come in with I. And then these are uh, ones of different origins, so G is thought to be possibly Welsh, or you see a lot in Cornwall is G, but they do appear in Ireland. They're not, it is indigenous to Ireland in a sense, more so than my half of group waiting here. So um, several years ago, I think it was 2006, uh, Trinity University in Dublin came out with a study in the Nile of the Nine Hostages, and they found a Y chromosome SNP, the M222, that corresponded to a Northwest Irish modal haplotype, and they call it, they also call it the Nile of the Nine Hostages. When you test your family tree DNA and you have an M222, you'll get a little logo that says Nile on it. So, and it, it's a good study to read, but it is dated, I gotta tell you. There's so much more out there now, and there's, experts here <laughs> that can tell you more about it. So uh, the M222 does have a project in Family Tree DNA. So Family Tree DNA set up a system called, called DNA Projects, and they allow volunteer, volunteers like myself, like everybody in this front row right here, Morris, and we all run DNA Projects. We don't get paid to do this, but the reason we do it is because we benefit from the correlating the data. And so this is a volunteer project for M222. So if you're a male and you come in with M222, you can join this project. It doesn't cost anything extra. And the volunteer administrators will answer questions for you. They'll also tell you if they think you need to do extended SNP testing because Family Tree DNA does have, they have boutique SNPs you can purchase in addition to a test called the Big Y, which is very popular. And you'll hear other speakers talk about that here. So, my McCallums. My McCallums, uh, my, my great-grandfather immigrated to America from Scotland in the late 1800s, and he settled in Montana first and then Wyoming. He was a coal miner, he wanted a better life. He was from the area of uh, Lanarkshire. Did I pronounce that right? Okay. <laughs> and um, he wanted a better life because you could only go so high in the coal mines, so he immigrated to America. And I still have cousins in Scotland, though, that are from this McCallum line that stayed. And I met them in 2016. I went, they lived down in the Borders area, and uh, one of them, uh, my cousin's father was there, and, well, he's my cousin too, like second cousin once removed. And so I asked him to DNA test, he said yes. I was ecstatic. That actually made my year, <laughs> that made my whole 2016, because I this line was dotted out, as I told you. There, I have no chance in North America of finding this Y chromosome or the origins. 
And so when he tested, I mean, I was just over the moon. Um, but it was interesting, so, I, and I found out from my cousin, I didn't know, because, you know, ignorant American, I'm sorry, I didn't know, I didn't know that any Irish famine, great famine immigrants went to Scotland. And these McCallums had done that. They came from County Tyrone and Cavan, hopefully I pronounced them right. Um, they immigrated to Scotland, and I, I was stuck in Brickwall. I am still Brickwalled in those County. However, when I DNA tested him, I learned that his DNA is Scottish. He only matches Scots. So at one time, they, they probably came over from Scotland into Ireland, maybe during Ulster Plantation or something. I don't know, because I'm stuck. But at least through DNA testing, I know that he's Scottish. Now, and he's, he's in this group five. Now, one of the things I want to point out here that's quite fascinating, I think, with this, with McCallum's and with Clyde McCallum, is that, you know, in clans and SEPs, you have a lot of variants of the surname. So if you look here in group four, you have a McCollum, a Malcolm, another McCollum, a McCallum, a McCollum with a U, and then another McCollum with an O. And so you have all these variants of the surnames, and even though they have some differences in the DNA, they match. These, these people, these McCallums are all related to each other, and wherever they immigrated or whether they stayed, they got these different variants of the surnames, but they've had the same, you know, McCallum DNA for hundreds of, of years, if not longer. Now, I want to explain this chart, especially for those of you that are new. When you do Y DNA testing, you get a set of these are called YSTRs, these little numbers right here, and then the haplogroup is predicted here. The haplogroup is in red, and ones that are SNP confirmed that have either been tested or the company confirmed are in green. This one, based on the length, I would say the person probably paid to have this one done, but this one's been confirmed. These <coughs> ones are predicted. So they're able to predict these based on these. So a group of haplotypes, this is this string of numbers, a DNA signature is called a haplotype. The haplotype, a group of haplotypes is what makes a haplogroup. So I remember early on when the little light bulb went on in my head and I figured that out. That was one of my beginner moments. So anyways, these, where they're colored, those are mutations. All, all the yellow are changes in the DNA that naturally occur um, in the Y chromosome. They tend to occur more rapidly. And then I've gone through and highlighted patterns of changes, like the 11s right here. That tells me that these men are probably more closely related to each other than, say, these two and this man because they all have the same change in their DNA. They probably inherited that from a common ancestor. I do use weasel words a lot, like probably, maybe, possibly, because you don't know for sure. Sometimes the DNA can be very vague. Sometimes it's definite, sometimes it's vague. In that case, it's vague, but um, that's at least the hypothesis I have is that they're closely related. So, and then I have these other McCallum clusters that are also you know, groups of clans and sects of McCallum. So um, my cousin that tested, he, he could care less about the, the thing I just showed you with the YSTR and the, the matches, the clan matches. I mean, he lives in Scotland. He knows he's Clan McCallum. He knows these things. He doesn't care about that. What he was over the moon about was that much Scandinavian, just absolutely over the moon. So he came in at 33% Scandinavian, and then if you tell, a, well, at least you tell my Scottish family that, they go, yes, we're Viking, yes. So, <laughs> quite thrilled, yes. So he, and, and it does tell you that. Now, here's the caveats with these numbers. See, he's got 2% Jewish diaspora. However, um, when you see very low numbers like that, they may be real and they may not be real. We call them remnants. Sometimes they could be remnants, sometimes they could be legitimate. The thing is, too, though, that you need to know about these numbers is they will change. They, won't, they might not change very much. Sometimes they do and people freak out, but um, they will change. And the reason they change is because all of the companies, all of the DNA companies, update their databases usually at least once a year. And they do it with the new data they bring in, and they also do it with the new scientific studies that come out. They add that data as well. Now. Another caveat is your 
percentages here will not be the exactly, exactly the same in each company. At least I've never seen that. I even have a friend who's a 100% Portuguese from mainland Portugal, and his has even changed. So um, these will change, and they will not be the same company wide, but they will be close. So sometimes you'll test in a company and you'll get a percentage like that, and, you're, ah, and then other times you'll think it's spot on, or you might think too, well, you know, I, I don't have any known Scandinavian ancestry. So for instance, when 20, I mean not 23, Ancestry.com first debuted their geographical uh, portions like this, they were Scandinavian heavy. So people that had Scandinavian, and I mean that had no known Scandinavian ancestry, came back with a Scandinavian result, and they're thinking, that's really strange. Why am I having a Scandinavian result? I don't have any known Scandinavian ancestry. And Ancestry said, well, you know, you're English, so um, you have Viking invasions. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, this is, is more recent. It's not as much as the ancient, like on the Y chromosome the mitochondrial. So as Ancestry has been filling out their database, they are, um, you're seeing less Scandinavian results in there. But the thing you need to know is that this will change. Don't freak out. It's a good thing because as more people test, then they're able to refine it better. Because if they don't have your kind of DNA in their database, you're gonna match the next closest thing. So usually in Western Europe, you don't see it as oddball off as some other countries, but um, it can happen. So I just wanted to let you know that. And they will not be the same company wide. The companies, this is an asset to them. It's a proprietary asset. So that is why they're different and they don't share with each other. It's um, you know, benefit of testing with the companies. So another interesting thing that I've heard, I wanna go back on the YSTR testing, is um, my husband, he, he has a lion line that is brick walled in 1809 in New York. So I started the Lion DNA project in 2004, and I got a match actually about 2006 through the National Geographic Genographic Project because National Geographic launched a DNA project and originally they did Y and MT testing, but now they've switched to autosomal. But back in the day when they did Y testing, Family Tree DNA was the company that did it for them. And you could add your results into the database for free. So um, the thing about the surname Lion is it appears in Ireland, Scotland, England, France, and Germany. So I didn't know where my husband's lion line was from because we were brick walled in 1809 in New York. But when through the National Geographic Project, he got a match from a man in England. So even though this man in England's genealogy did not go back as far as my husband's, I think it started around the 1850s, it still gave me a, a point of research focus. Of, and I could also discount those other countries. It was beneficial. And so far, that's the only match he's had is this gentleman from England. So his lion line probably came from England. Now, I have a friend in England, <coughs> Brian Swan, who did a bunch of research for me, uh, genealogy research, on my Scottish lions. And he found that I have this lion line. And my lion line happens to be this lion line, which was a shocker for me. <laughs> so the queen is, queen mom's my cousin. Um, and the queen, current queen. But anyways, what's fascinating about this particular lion line, it's very well documented. There's a book on Google called, I think it's called The Lion's Memorial. And uh, the lion is thought to go back as far as William the Conqueror. So, um, and what was another thing that's fascinating about it is branches of this lion went to other countries. They went, they didn't stay just in England. They went to Scotland and they went to Ireland. And so we have testers in the lion project that match each other that are all from this lion line. Now, I, I don't have my lion line, I mean, it's not on this particular page, but anyways, it connects to this one, so. I, both my husband and I have lion's ancestry, but they don't match each other. That's, that's another thing you can find out using DNA. C2, the McCallums and the lions are both that R1B, the one that I said is the most common one in Western Europe. So the path of mitochondrial DNA is on a female line, although, Males get it too. So all of you males in the room, you have your mother's mitochondrial DNA, which she passed to you, but only your wives will pass it to your children. Children only receive it from the mother. So you can test for your mother's origins, but um, 
it will not be passed on to your children. They would have their mother's uh, mitochondrial DNA. So this is a picture of me, and that's my father. And my father was an only child. And his mother, who's the child in the middle, she was an only child. This picture's taken in Scotland. And this is my great-grandmother and my great-great-grandmother. So this is my mitochondrial line on my father's, and it's haplogroup H, which is the most common in Western Europe. But what was, even though I have not been able to get a genealogical success story with it, I do have matches to H's that are from the Aberdeen area, and this is where they were from. My father, um, actually, he, I started doing DNA testing in 2003, the same year he was diagnosed with cancer and he died within months. And I'm not telling you this to bum you out or anything. I'm telling you this because I am so glad I tested him when I did. I mean, we didn't know he was gonna get cancer. And Family Tree DNA will store the DNA for 25 years. They don't charge extra to do storage. And I'm the proxy for the kit so I, and the beneficiary. I was able to upgrade his kit and find out what his mitochondrial DNA was. And I would not have been able to do that if it hadn't been um, for that they stored it because my dad was the only child, my, my grandmother's the only child from Scotland. I had no other mitochondrial DNA sources from this family. So that, that's one of the benefits too. Don't wait, test people when you can. Don't procrastinate. It would have bit me if I had. So this is when you test your family tree DNA, in your results page, you get uh, a certificate, and these are my dad's very basic HBR1, HBR2 mitochondrial DNA results, and you know it says it's half a group of H. And you get the same thing too for Y chromosome DNA, but it does not really derive any significance until you're able to compare it. You have to see your matches in the database, and additionally, it is beneficial if you join a project because not only can you get the help from the project administrators, but you, it also helps to see the results refined down to an area. So for my dad's mitochondrial DNA, I have that in the Scottish Origins project that Allie McDonald runs. So uh, the other thing too that you get with the different haplogroups is you get origins, and these are the most common ones in Western Europe. Brian Sykes wrote a book about it back in, um, oh gosh, 2000, I think, uh, called The Seven Daughters of Eve. And that's why you see those, you see where it says clan mother, Helena, Velda, Iris. So when he wrote the book, it was a very popular book. It's probably in some of your local libraries. Um, it's, a lot of people will refer to their haplogroups with these names like Helena and things. So you don't see it as much anymore, but especially in the early days we did. Something I wanna point out here though is my haplogroup, which I have on my badge here, N, is not on here. So I want to I want to note I want you to note that that there's for Ireland there's no N on this list because um, my uh, Irish uh, my maternal line traces back to an Irish famine immigrant who sailed on the ship Laurel out of Cork in 1848 and um, settled in Chicago by everything we know. The way she identified herself in the census, the way the families identified, Irish, Catholic. So as far as I know, we were Irish and Catholic, and my mother always said, you're Irish, that's why you like potatoes. So <laughs> you know, that's how I was raised. Um, this is her daughter. I don't have a picture of the immigrant, but this is her daughter, Johanna Hall. We say Powell in America, but Paul, oh. Paul, Paul, Cindy's a Powell expert, but Paul expert, P-O-W-E-L-L. -L. So this is Johanna Paul, and um, she was the daughter of the immigrant, but I don't have a picture of the immigrant, and her father was also Irish. Um, this is a Holy Family Church from Chicago, Illinois. This is a church where they were baptized. So we even have a great Chicago fire story. I've never been able to uh, verify it, but supposedly uh, Johanna was friends. She's a teenager at the time. She was friends with the woman, the daughter of the woman, Mrs. O'Leary, who was having a party. And supposedly Mrs. O'Leary, uh, it wasn't her cow. They went to milk it. This girl was flirting with a boy. The cow was cranky. It had already been milked, kicked the lantern over, started the fire. That's my fire story. <laughs> have not been able to verify it. But supposedly she was at the party. Probably lots of Irish in Chicago had that story. But anyways, they got out of the fire, they survived, they had descendants, you know, so.
Um, and she eventually ended up moving to California. That is where I am from. So, um, and this is a, uh, the parish record for when, in Chicago for uh, her mother. Now, something I want to point out here is her mother's name is Julia English. And it's not a big stretch to know that English is not an Irish surname. So it is, it, it is even, I mean, it's very common in Cork. There's a man that sells ships down in Cork that is named uh, with a surname English, but it is not an, uh, an Irish surname. Additionally, we believe that they're from the area of, um, I'll probably mispronounce it, Ballylanders? I got it right? Okay, Ballylanders, which means place of the Londoners. So we've got these, these poles in this English from the place of the Londoners, and guess what? My mitochondrial DNA is not indigenous to Ireland. I was so surprised when I found that out because I was expecting, again, remember I like potatoes, I'm Irish, the whole thing, I was raised like that, but I'm not indigenous to Ireland. My, my haplogroup is N, which is very extremely rare. And most of my matches are in Italy, and it's cute because sometimes people will say, well, you look Italian. But I have, no, I have no known Italian ancestry. I do talk with my hands a lot, but I don't, I don't have any known Italian ancestry. Now, that begs the question. I, I'm from an Irish family immigrant on my mitochondrial DNA. I was raised as having Irish ancestry. I do have a Kennedy on my father's side too, just so you know, it's still in there. But am I Irish? So that's the question. Now, when it comes down to it, only I can answer that question because my identity is up to me. And these people, at whatever time that they came over and settled in, in County Limerick um, and became Irish and Catholic and moved to America and had that identity, they assimilated. I have ancestors that were French that fled St. Bartholomew's Day's Massacre and went to Scotland. So there, there's this interesting question of when do you stop being one thing and become another? Because, but it's really up to you. Your identity is up to you. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm still Irish even if I don't have a haplogroup group on my female line that's indigenous to Ireland. My ancestors were Irish, they identified as Irish. I was raised that I'm Irish or part Irish. And I do have this Kennedy ancestor that, that fled Emmett's Rebellion too, but on my bad side. So anyways, I just wanted to go over that with you because it's very interesting on the identity theme. So if any of you DNA test and you get something oddball, you know, feel free to come talk to me about it or anything like that but your identity is up to you. DNA is just a part of it that you can incorporate into it. So here's a, a map, uh, Morris and I are, okay, five minutes. Morris and I are co-administrators on the Ireland MTDNA project. And uh, in Family Tree DNA, it'll give a map with your matches and show the origins of where they're from. I wanna go over autosomal DNA briefly. This is a, a, a image that I borrowed from 23andMe that shows uh, you, dad, mom, and then it goes out to fifth cousin. Now, fifth cousin for most people could be about the 1800s, but when you enter your ancestors on autosomal DNA, go back, if you have as far back as the 1600s, please enter them because you will get matches back that far. So you wanna enter as much as you can on there because you never know what comes through. I, I've seen some crazy things come through. This is a, I like this example. This is what Family Tree DNA's chart used to look like, but it's a good visual, so I still use it. So on the autosomal DNA testing, this is my brother. He comes in as 100% European. This is, and we have the same parents, just so you know. This is me, and I come in with 8.21 Middle Eastern, which in Family Tree DNA language, that's Jewish, at least, you know, on the old chart. So I don't have any known Jewish ancestry, but... My Irish great-grandmother married a man that had Bohemian ancestry. So I think it may have come from Bohemia, which no longer exists. You think I have problems on my Irish line, you should see the Bohemian line. <laughs> so Middle Eastern is, um, their surnames were Ingle and Bauman. They very well could have been Jewish, but I, I still need to research that and hopefully test cousins someday. And then this is my son's chart. And as you can see, my son has an additional, I call him pizza slice, of Native American DNA, and he gets that from my husband. 
So the thing I want to point out, though, with <coughs> the brother oops, and the sister is that siblings do not inherit the exact same amount of DNA from the parents. You know, your ancestry doesn't work like that. If you're, say, English and Irish or Scottish and Irish, your brother could be, you know, 20, 80, and you could be 60, 40. So it does help to test your siblings because they will come out different than you. So um, in Family Tree DNA, this is called the chromosome browser. Only Family Tree DNA and 23andMe have these. There are workarounds, though, that you'll see in a later presentation. I only have a few minutes left, so I have to talk fast. The dark blue is me on this chart. This is me. This is my first cousin once removed is orange. And then these two are fourth cousins. So areas where we have the overlap, I know I'm looking at DNA from my maiden name line, which is very important to me because I don't have a Y chromosome. So I can see my maiden name line, my bolt DNA, which is my maiden name, in using my cousins for proxies and in there. You will also match strangers though. This is, um, I'm using my son as an example because I have permission to do so for my child. So uh, my son shows as a match to myself and my husband, so nobody's in trouble here. Um, the computer will automatically predict how we're related. It says parent or child. We know that we're his parents. It gives the amount of DNA in common. You can put in the known relationship for my brother. I put uncle pending so you can see what that looks like. And then you get, it highlights all the matches to all the surnames we have in common. And of course, it highlights it on both my husband and I since he's our child and has all those surnames in common. And again, too, you will get matches to strangers. I just use my own family as an example. So ISOG, which is International Society of Gene Gene Genealogy, is free to join. We've been, we were founded in 2005. We have met over 20,000 members in 70 countries. Morris is great. At, he runs a group called Genetic Gene Genealogy Ireland. So you can join that. Uh, but it's all of our help is free. Um, we have a Facebook group too, and it has, I think it's up to about 15,000 members or more now. Um, books. So I included two books that are from, that were written in the United Kingdom. So this one but, uh, by Chris Pomery, and then DNA and Social Networking by Debbie Kennett. And Debbie Kennett is here this weekend. Um, but if you have British ancestry, those are two very good books to use. Um, I also, for a more recent up-to-date book, but you know, something you gotta keep in mind too is that, oh, sorry. <laughs> Can you fix that for us? I hit it. So, something to keep in mind is that DNA is kind of like computers. It, it advances so rapidly that things change. So when a book comes out, inevitably something in the book will change. So, um, Blaine has one of the most recent books out, and this is a really good book. But just know the caveat, there's something that could change in there. There are two books that are available for sale out here. This one is, uh, what did she say, 17 pounds? And this one is five pounds. Now the difference between the two, this is a book like Blaine's and the authors out there, Emily Alessino, and she would sign it for you. This one is really good for adoptees. If you have adoptees in your family and you want to use DNA for adoptees, this book is a page turner. And it also gives info not only on how to use DNA for adoptees, but also other tips to try when you're trying to get records out of the local records office. So this, it's a really fascinating book. Um, we also have out there at the Family Tree DNA stand, there's a, uh, it's, see how it says free and then sponsors in quotes, DNA tests. So, project administrators like myself, and many of my projects are on here, like McCallum and Lyons, uh, will sponsor tests for people to, especially in other countries, because it helps us with the matching. So if you check the surname poster out there, there there's an up-to-date one in the stand. This one's a dated image, and you can see if your name's on there. But this is primarily for white chromosome testing, although there is a Family Finder project for Coverly that, ha that will take in other surnames. That's an autosomal test. And then finally, uh, thank you very much, and I'll answer any questions. Appreciate you coming. Excellent. Um, thanks for a fabulous uh, talk. Uh, a great introduction of, about DNA for the audience. Um, just as a, a kind of show of hands, how many people actually have Scottish uh, ancestry in their family trees? So there's actually quite a few people. Any McCallums? <laughs> Does anyone have any McCallum ancestry? No, no McCallums. But I, I guess your McCallums would be 
uh, a great example of what a lot of people would have in their own family trees. Well, you know, when we were down in Dublin in 2014, and I stupidly did not put McCallum on this list, and McCallum walked up and went to someone else, not me, and I missed it. I missed the boat, so I've got everybody on there now. <laughs> okay, questions for, for Catherine. Yeah, we have a question here. Let me bring the microphone down to you. When somebody else in your family gets tested, are you permitted to see everything that they get? So the question was, um, if someone else in my family gets tested, am I permitted to see everything they get? It, it depends. So most of the time, yes, because I'm the one doing the asking and the paying and the, and the testing. So I even have a private family project at Family Tree DNA for my family and friends. And, so, and then I will help them and educate them. Sometimes uh, the person will test on their own, like especially at another company, like 23andMe, and then they'll do a sharing request and I can see it. So um, usually though, usually yes. Great question. Um, anybody else? Right here. Do we have a question here? Let me come around to you. There we go. Odd one, odd question. Um, I just saw an article, uh, I think it was yesterday, either on BBC or, or Guardian, about how this, uh, Genetic activity continues once we're dead. Have you saw that article? No. <laughs> it's in there, and you, it, it was online. That's how I saw it. Anyway, what I was thinking about was that, was you were talking about the uh, Marie Antoinette's hair. I have teeth. My mother had everybody's teeth coated back forever. Have you ever heard of, like, would that be something you'd do with a forensic pathologist, or where would you do something like that? So our question is, she has some of her mother's teeth, and she wants to know if she can get viable DNA out of it. And the answer is maybe. There are people that have gotten vi viable DNA out of teeth, but sometimes it's difficult. Like I'll give you an example where it failed is, I know somebody that had a golden case tooth of Benjamin Franklin, and they've had a very difficult time trying to pin down Benjamin Franklin's Y chromosome. So they, they did drill through this golden case tooth, but they were not able to get viable DNA out of it. Um, in last October, we went on a tour with Dan Bradley at Trinity University in Dublin. And the way that a lot of the geneticists are able to get by viable DNA, we probably wouldn't want to do this right now though, is there's, there's a bone inside the skull that um, can hold it for, I don't know, thousands of years. Do you remember the name of that bone? Petrus or? Petrus. Yeah. Petrus? So, yeah, but Petrus bone. teeth is a, is a gamble, so. I would wait, if I were you, I'd wait until you know the technology is more advanced before you try it too, and try to find a proxy like I did with my cousin in Scotland. So, if, if I, was, I don't want to go too long, but um, if you're talking about finding a bone, if you had someone with Zoom, and, and yeah. something like that? Technically, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know, so, Thank she you. asked if you could have someone exhumed if you want to use a bone. You could, but I've heard that it's exorbitantly expensive. <laughs> There's a genetic genealogist in America that was so desperate to try to find out. She got a price for exhumation. It was like twenty thousand oh dollars. So, um, <laughs> yeah. If you got a, do you have a letter with a stamp, a lick stamp? <laughs> so you might have a better shot with that. Of course, the technology is improving all the time. True. So, and in fact, uh, with Richard the Third, when they found his remains, they actually used one of his teeth to extract some of the DNA. But Dan Bradley was telling us that. Um, the amount of DNA you get from teeth is about, it's about 10% human DNA and then 10% contamination from the soil. In your case, it'll be different because the teeth are preserved out of the soil. But if you're exhuming somebody, there's a lot of bacterial contamination um, and you only get about 10% human DNA from teeth. But from the petrous bone, you get 58% human DNA, even from ancient skeletons. And so there's huge advances being made now in ancient DNA and the recovery of this ancient DNA from ancient remains. And that's a very, very fast uh, evolving science. So watch this space because there will be, in a few years time, those teeth that you have will become gold mines because the technology, the price will come down and you'll be able to get those tested and you'll be able to find out the DNA of your ancestors. I agree with Morris, the, the way the technology is advancing. Something fascinating that Dan Bradley said, and sorry for you beginners, but the more advanced will under, they'll get this, but it, it's just mind blowing. He said that some of the remains, like the, the Portuguese ones that were found, 
He said, when you think of the ancient remains that are found, their DNA is so different from us that you think of them like space aliens, that it's that different. And so, for instance, my husband's Portuguese, so one of the tests I want to do on him is a, the big Y test because it's next generation sequencing. And that'll, that is the closest I probably can get to these space alien Portuguese remains. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what, what else I've heard of, but um, they happen to be the same haplogroup as my husband, the haplogroup I. So that, that's as close as I can get to them, but it's fascinating. There's a question here. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's, suppose it's more of an observation in a way, in terms of you're talking about the Bones line, line and I, I wasn't quite sure whether, whether it was uh, autosomal or the mitochondria. It's Y chromosome. It's Y chromosome, okay. Well, it's interesting in terms of, there is a link with um, the Queen Mother and a very famous Irishman who is Hugh O'Neill, uh, who was obviously Earl of Tyrone at the time of the plantation, and I don't know whether that goes down, uh, it, it probably isn't, uh, a, a, it's probably more the mother's line, but it's just interesting to kind of speculate, is there some way we could get hold of the clan chief's DNA? Obviously we've got Nile of the Nine hostages, but certainly I'm in Fermanagh, and one of the things that interests me is the idea of being able to get a definitive Maguire, or a definitive, mm -hmm. so I don't know. It's a, a great question. Can you answer that one more? Sure, yeah, because we, we actually, in Dublin, two years ago, we had Sir Conor O'Brien, who has a 32-generation pedigree that goes back to Brian Brew and its paper, paper trail pedigree, all the way back to Brian Brew. He did his DNA test. He matches a whole load of O'Briens from uh, Tipperary and Southern, Southern Ireland, um, and therefore, because his pedigree goes all the way back, they can piggyback onto him because they are genetic cousins and go all the way back to Brian Boru how, how many years ago, a thousand years ago or so. So um, it is happening. And more and more of the surname projects that we run as volunteers are actually exploring ways of uh, identifying the location of ancient remains of some of the clan chiefs and then trying to exhume them and test their teeth or test their petrous bone. So that is currently going on with the O'Briens, and they're looking for ancient O'Brien samples. There's a heart in Rome. There's other 19 other places where there are ancient O'Brien samples, and over the course of the next few years, we will see more and more ancient O'Briens, Maguires, uh, Simpsons, whatever, uh, a lot of the Scottish clans as well. A lot of them will actually be able to link back to the ancient clans. How about O'Neill? Do you know if there's been testing on the O'Neills? On the O'Neill side, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But that would be another very important dynasty to test. Well, we have to leave it there and move on to the next one, but can I please ask you to give a warm round of appreciation and applause to Martin Thank you, Martin.